This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Division of Arts and Humanities at the University of California, San Diego, presents Degrees of Health and Well-Being, a series of public lectures featuring leading faculty from multiple disciplines in history, science, medicine, and social science, each sharing their latest groundbreaking research, impacting the quality of life for you, your family, your region, and your world. It's really exciting to be here tonight on behalf of the Institute for Public Health um, to hear Ram speak and, and talk about such a critically important issue for our generation and, and more importantly for the generations to come. I wanted to just tell people a little bit about the Institute for Public Health. Um, we started in about a year and a half ago and the idea was to, to move beyond the walls of our department in the School of Medicine, of Family Medicine and Public Health to connect all the amazing scientists and social scientists and humanity folks on this campus around the themes of public health. And for example, climate change and public health is one of those things that you can't study unless you get a whole bunch of different people together to think about it. And that's what we really need to solve these huge problems. We, we have to get out of all of our silos and come together you know, for the common good. So that's really the mission of the Institute and our activities form along the lines of the strategic plan for the university. We have research focused events, we have student centered events, and we have community engaged events. And we're trying to bring all of those areas, um, you know, to connect the dots in those areas. We've had um, several large meetings where we've had faculty from 40 different departments come together and as a result for our research focus, we have three theme areas. One is technology in public health, one is lifestyle and well-being in public health, and one is climate change in public health. And that um, part, that working group is led by Dr. Yael Al-Dalemi from our department of Family Medicine and Public Health and Ram. And we very much appreciate Ram's involvement in that working group and also um, as serving as one of our internal advisors for the Institute. Um, so those, um, I'm just thrilled to, to be here tonight and to welcome Ram to the podium to speak to us today about In Pursuit of the Common Good, a new alliance between science, religion, and policy. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Bess. It's really a great honor uh, to be giving this uh, last lecture of this series. Uh, I didn't tell Steve I had a vested interest in giving this lecture. Uh, I, I've been on this path of trying to form an alliance between science and religion and policy to get us out of this uh, I would say, to be blunt, a mess with respect to climate change. And I've I given this lecture mainly with academics last uh, couple of years. But I didn't want to take this message to the public. So this is the first time I have the opportunity to talk to the uh, general public about this. So if you look at the title, Common Good, science, religion, and policy, you would guess that I'm probably a social scientist, a sociologist, or a political scientist, or even a religious scholar, but I'm none of the above. Uh, I, I'm really an atmospheric physicist working on the intersection of chemistry and physics, so that's how you, we pollute the atmosphere. They put chemical substances, and you know they form new compounds and then which they impact the energy flow and sort of affects the climate. So how did I enter this strange world? And in fact, I had the most auspicious beginning. Uh, this was uh, 10 years ago in 2004. 
I was doing a, a study of air pollution from South Asia in the Indian Ocean off of Maldives. And it was one day when, when we lost our uh, aircraft. It's a small unmanned aircraft. I was pretty frustrated. I opened up my laptop. I was staying in the village chief's house. <coughs> we, we were uh, doing this from a native village, not the Maldivian resorts. And um, I opened it, and, and this email started off with attachment said, Pope Fran uh, uh, John Paul. I immediately knew it was a spam email, so I was just going to <laughs> delete it. But somehow, the curiosity got the better of me, and then it was really an invitation uh, to this academy, and I didn't know anything about this academy. And uh, this academy reports directly to the Pope, and he personally uh, inducts you into the academy, as you see here, I got a beautiful chain. <clears throat> And you see uh, my reaction. I did feel something in his presence. There are a few people you feel you know, that there is something about them. But there was another th expression on my face is that I thought the Pope is going to find out I'm not a Catholic and kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> it was five years I mean, into the academy I realized uh, and I was later made a council member of the six or seven, is purely international scope, just incredibly uh, impressive, multiracial in composition, and they don't worry about what your religion is. So finally I was able to tell them, I'm not even a Christian, I hope I can still stay. <laughs> and um, so it turns out, you know, the members are drawn from all disciplines. I, I just had one of the most intellectually exciting meetings twice a year we meet, and a third of them are Nobel laureates. The president of the academy, Werner Arbor, made his name in the RNA research. He got his Nobel Prize in the 70s. Many, many such uh, unique people. And then from the papal handshake to Papal hug happened uh, this year, uh, last year, when I helped the Vatican organize a summit for city mayors. And, uh, and, and, and that's when this journey of alliance between science, religion, and policy culminated as far as I'm concerned. We've got the, all the mayors of the world, and I had uh, I invited uh, our governor, Jerry Brown, and um, I made a catastrophic mistake. It's the first time I'm uh, admitting it, and uh, hopefully the Tribune won't modify their story <laughs> after hearing this. I thought I was allowed to invite only one, so I invited Jerry Brown. So uh, there were four mayors from California. My catastrophic mistake was not inviting our mayor, because he would have been the only Republican mayor and that too would have been the pioneering mayor. He's put our city on the path of carbon neutrality. Just uh, anyway, uh, next time I meet him, or you can tell him, I, <laughs> this is my confession uh, for the day. <laughs> anyway, uh, then uh, I, I sort of feel very confident on talking about this alliance. Because as you know, there was a major summit. Every year, people involved in climate, all the leaders meet. And I watched them meet for 21 years. You know, uh, I've seen uh, our President Clinton, and now the later President Obama. Every year, the result is the same, nothing. And I don't know how many of you remember how Einstein defined, defined insanity. Is that doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result every time, right? Anyway, uh, this time, the church invited me uh, to be uh, part of the delegation. They've never uh, invited a scientist. Video of the country's, country's delegation of scientists. And I'll later talk to you about uh, what little role I was able to play. Uh, and in the middle is Cardinal Turkson from Ghana. In fact, he was in contention for to become the pope. And he wrote the famous encyclical with Pope Francis. 
and I had worked with Cardinal Turkson a few on this. And when Pat Morrison of LA Times heard about this, she said, that's wonderful and very helpful. Galileo would be smiling. And, and, and I, I told Pat, I wish you had not put this insidious thought in my mind. I'm still thinking, I hope I don't suffer the same fate as Galileo. <laughs> so where did this all begin? And I'm sort of taking your personal journey. How does a scientist, natural scientist, get involved? So my journey began, you know, began this is my ancestral village. And uh, I used to visit my grandfather every summer till I was about 13 or 14. His house is to the left of this picture, but that got washed away in the monsoon rain. So I took this picture in 2004. I, I was that kid, topless kid, sitting on that veranda, watching the days pass by. There's almost nothing to do. But you still see these children remarkable sense of hope, you know, laughter, excitement. And I, I was that kid. So why did I come to the US? I don't think any one of you can guess the reason. It's not pursuit of science. It's not pursuit of education. It's to buy the Impala car. <laughs> <clears throat> This, of course, was a picture taken in the Balboa Park. Why, why a car? You know, my father was a salesman of tires. You know, we were in small towns. He was working at Goodyear Tire Company. He used to bring these beautiful brochures and you know, beautiful cars. I got hooked on the American cars. So that's all I wanted to. I came here to enjoy the good life. But fate struck in un unexpected ways. I did my P I came here for a PhD in 1970. I was an engineer. I hated engineering. I wanted to switch my field. I, 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 there's nothing special about the engineering field. I was just not cut out to be an engineer. Anyway, after I joined, my professor at Stony Brook, as far as I did my PhD, switched his field on the day I came. I thought I'll get an engineering PhD, quickly join a company, and get that Impala. But he, he changed his field. And his field was greenhouse effect of Mars and Venus. So when I finished, uh, I couldn't get a job in India. And I still remember what my father said. What you're doing is so esoteric. Only America can afford to pay someone like you. So I came back. <laughs> and I joined NASA uh, Langley. So my daytime job was to look at the effect of the CFCs on the uh, ozone layer. But I knew because of my training in physics and quantum mechanics, the chlorofluorocarbons, it has a chlorine atom and the fluorine, they're highly reactive. And they have what we call dipole moment. They absorb radiation. <clears throat> so I said, I'm going to take a look at this greenhouse effect of CFCs. I couldn't do it during the daytime, so nights and, and, and I just married my wife about a year ago, so she put up with a lot of this. And she, my good fortune is she got excited about my research. Anyway, I, I was shocked to find a ton of these compounds have the same greenhouse effect or warming of the planet as more than 10,000 tons of carbon dioxide. So clearly a super pollutant. And, and it was so unbelievable, I repeated my calculation the whole time before, sure. And I don't know what made me submit this science as the most prestigious journal. I was just shocked. They accepted it with very little change. It never happens. This is a dream of most academics. Send a paper to science and get accepted without any edits. Anyway, uh, I knew it was important, but you know, I was too young to know how important it was. And it made the front page of uh, New York Times the same day it was published. And Walter Sullivan, I think if you know him, then I know your age. <laughs> you must be at least 70 or older. He was the dean of science reporting. And uh, he had no problem understanding it beautifully. He just got stuck on my name. So I had to spell it 10 times before he got that right, the first name. 
Anyway, then I, 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 I realized this is something huge that I, didn't, I couldn't believe our atmosphere was so vulnerable, although it's still a theoretical work at that stage. And, and the reason it was met with disbelief, you know, a famous Harvard professor, a physicist, called it two words, BS, both are four-letter words, so you can guess what the B and the S stands for. I mean, uh, he said this to Walter Cronkite, who wanted to interview me. And a Princeton scientist said, dangerous. It took scientists about five to 10 years to confirm my work. So then I, okay, so until that time I published, scientists thought carbon dioxide from fossil fuel is the only greenhouse gas you have to worry about, okay? So suddenly I come with this, and that opened a Pandora's box. Other scientists came with other chemicals, suddenly the list became large. Then I knew that this thing is going to dawn on us much sooner, this warming. So as you know, every science or every scientific discovery is tested by its predictions. Einstein's famous prediction of, you know, sun's rays will be bent by the planets and the uh, stars' gravity. Same way I made the prediction that if this theory is real, at that time there's still a theory as far as I'm concerned we should see the warming by year 2000. If you don't see it, then I know there is some flaw. Unfortunately, that prediction came true. This is a temperature record of the planet. You know, we measured temperature of the planet over thousands of stations, individual stations. And you can see our climate goes up and down. You know, some days, some decades it warms, some it's cold, some it's warm, some it's cold. We made our prediction when the planet was still cooling. So of course, again, many of my colleagues thought I was crazy. By this time, they stopped calling my work BS. They, they knew, thought to be careful. And, and so you can see 1980, 2000 is when the United Nations commissioned a group of 2,000 scientists from around the world. UCSD had a major role in that. And they said, yes, there is a discernible warming. And that warming is from human activities, exactly what we had predicted. So it came to uh, uh, fruition. I mean, I, it's, not, it's a good thing for me as a scientist, not a good thing for us as human beings, that this theory has been verified. So moving on, and the other thing I want to point out is that many, most of the controversy about climate change, so, you know, 40% of Americans don't believe in this. Even the other 54, 55 who believe in climate change don't think we need to take action. A very small minority, 15%, think we should take actions now. That's because most of the studies use models. And I personally, because of my training, I don't believe anything unless I can touch it, feel it, smell it, and measure it, okay? So, for example, I helped launch one of the first satellites to look at the heat flow of the Earth. Then we used this unmanned aircraft. This was used in the Iraq war to look at the tracking the, you know, the enemy with cameras. So we turned that sword into a plow, miniaturized instruments, squeeze them into this unmanned aircraft, and make measurements. So most of my work is on experimental basis. It's on that basis I'm saying climate change is real. The theory has been shown with predictions. So let me just give you a brief uh, summary of why this invisible substance which comes out of your tailpipes, carbon dioxide, has this, and other greenhouse gases, has this effect. All the fuels are hydrocarbons, hydrogen and carbon. When you burn them, the carbon becomes carbon dioxide, combines with oxygen. It's an inevitable, ultimate byproduct of even you burn anything. So why is this such an insidious component? When you release it, 50% of it stays for 100 years. Other 50% is taken away within a year or two by terrestrial biota, marine biota, etc. So 50% stays for 100 years and over 20% stays for 1,000 years to 1,000 to 5,000. So the stuff that's accumulating, 
So we have dumped about two trillion tons. About a trillion tons up there. By the sheer weight, it's equal to 500 billion cars circling the planet. Just imagine that. The sad thing is they're in the gaseous form, we can't see it. But Scripps at UCSD are the pioneers who documented this uh, gas in the air. So what it does is it cover the entire planet like a blanket, okay? And, and don't get fooled, this blanket is about trillion tons thick. So why should we worry about the blanket? So this is my uh, first lecture of my climate course. I'm condensing my entire quarter course into two minutes. So just imagine the Earth was merrily going along until Mr. James Watt invented the steam engine and ushered the fossil fuel era. The fundamental energy for the planet is incident sunlight. About 30% is bounced back to space by clouds, ice, blah, blah, blah. So the remaining 70% heats the planet, and the planet gives off this heat as infrared. It is that infrared heat, which would have escaped to space, is trapped by this man-made blanket. Okay? The way it acts is exactly how a blanket keeps you warm on a cold winter night. The blanket doesn't give you any heat, it just traps your body heat. That's exactly how this one trillion ton blanket works. It's proved beyond any doubt. Quantum mechanics has already predicted this. So there's no way to escape. The only issue is how, how large and how soon. Okay? Those are issues we are still grappling with. So now let me take you to the Paris Agreement. Okay? The Paris Agreement is a watershed moment for the common good. Remember, Climate change is a common good. The carbon dioxide we emit travels within two years to the entire planet, covers it like a blanket, traps the heat, and the droughts and the storms it unleashes could be felt all over the planet, including the regions in the tropics where three billion people live with no access to these fossil fuels. Okay? So that's why it's a common good. That's why it is so difficult for us to take actions. We don't see it. Somebody else is going to benefit. Okay? So the Paris Agreement, all the 195 nations signed on, I was there, it was just a truly historic moment. But it's a classical example of an emperor without clothes. There is no commitment to cut the emissions drastically. They all said, I'll cut this, I'll cut this. When you add it all up, right now we are emitting 50 billion tons. Just imagine that. We are just tossing 25 billion cars into the air. Okay? And it will increase from 50 to 57. Where do we want to go to stop climate change? It should go from 50 to 20, 50% less. So the warming, this, uh, the next two are my own predictions, the same model which I used to predict in 1980. The warming will exceed two degrees. So you ask, what is the big deal about two degrees? The weather changes by 15, 20 degrees day to day. To see a planet which was warmer than present by two degrees, you have to go back millions of years. But 130,000 years ago, the planet was warmer by a degree and a half. I am predicting we will see that in 15 years. We already warmed one degree. That planet 130,000 years ago, sea level was higher by 30 feet. We're not talking about inches, we're not talking about 30 feet, but it took some time, centuries. And then if you still merrily keep going, the warming will exceed four degrees because every 30 years, we are putting one more trillion tons. By 2030, the third trillion would be up there. Another 20 years, the fourth trillion. By the time you exceed four degrees, you're going back to the time Jurassic Park time. Dinosaurs roamed the Earth. That's when, how far you have to go. None of the ecosystems would be, you know, would know such a planet. Everything has to readapt. <clears throat> 
So, and, and I proposed, fortunately, there is still time to solve this problem. Okay? And first we have to, you know, what's called, we have to decarbonize our economy, bring down the CO2 emissions. Immediately people think, scientists like me are trying to make you go to the horse buggy days. And in fact, in Chicago, uh, when I was there for four years, I was interviewed after a major publication as interviewed as this spicy eating scientist with unpronounceable name has come from India to destroy American economy. <laughs> so, no, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is fossil fuels has become an outdated energy source. Switch to renewables, solar, wind, and you enjoy the comfort even more. No one is going to be breathing down your neck. Nor would you be raising sea level, nor would you be causing storms. So, but that's not enough. Because carbon dioxide, like a super tank, it takes a long time. You see the curve I have, the black dash. I cut the emissions by 2020. We don't feel it till 2070. It takes 50 years. So we need something quick. So think of that we have two levers to pull. First is the carbon dioxide. It's very difficult. Our economy is tied to that. Okay. There's another one. Remember I discovered the chlorofluorocarbons? They become part of these other pollutants. We call them short-lived climate pollutants. There are four of them. It's methane, these halocarbons, ozone, and black carbon. Black carbon is a particle. California has got two of the four by 90%, so we have the technology. So that lever, you can pull very fast. And you can bring down the warming by 50% within the next 30 years. So you do both, then you see the blue curve in the, come to the yellow zone. Okay, the green is where we want to be. We are not never going to be there anymore. We are already committed to degree and a half. But if we can just avoid that cliff of two degrees. Okay? So but we are awfully close to that cliff. Let me talk to the, one of the V major issues. We talk about climate change, we talk about sea level rise, glacier melting, droughts, fires, they're all happening. Only now we're slowly starting to work on climate change and health. This one is the direct emissions of fossil fuels and combustion, the smoke released, the pollutants released, kills close to seven million every year. It's a silent killer the second leading risk factor for global burden of disease. I'm not, I'm not trying to put down heart disease, AIDS, cancer, they're all you know, uh, hugely important, but air pollution, to me, it is sad. It is a problem we can solve overnight. California solved this problem. If you go back to the 60s, Los Angeles was competing with London for the most polluted city in the planet. Just like now Delhi is competing with Beijing, and look at the deaths in that region, 80% of the total 7 million deaths occur in Asia. It's such a solvable problem. Why are we not solving it? I'll come to that next. This is why I went to the church. So now we'll talk about the alliance between science and religion. So after three, four years, joining the church, and I knew my, the fact that I'm not a Christian, a Hindu, is not going to get me kicked out. I realized that we, as in the members of the academy, can organize meetings. So I organized one of the meetings on glacier melt, because it's close to Europeans. Europeans have lost three-fourths of the volume of water in the Alps, and our meeting uncovered that. What was news at the end of the meeting, we all come with scientific declarations, but the last paragraph of the declaration included the statement, if we want justice and peace, we must protect the habitat that sustains us. N not one of that word would ever enter into my lexicon, so I was shocked. I realized the power of the religion to bring this moral issues. See, as a scientist, as a physical scientist, I think social, we have put this wall around us. Oh, we can't talk about issues beyond our science. So, but this gave 
the chance to talk about the truth of the problem. It is a moral, ethical problem. When we emit something, a pollutant, and it kills somebody else, that's an ethical issue, common goods issue, right? So that was an eye-opener for me. Then I briefed, normally after this, we briefed the Pope. I briefed here Pope Benedict. And I talked to him a little bit about the moral issues, and he encouraged us to organize a meeting just on that topic. Okay? And in parallel, I was working on this whole issue of the poor, and I spent about uh, uh, six months, my wife and I, in villages in India. And uh, every five or six days, that woman, they're cooking, she's cooking my breakfast. I, I was a house guest. And, uh, Every five, six days, we would escape to the nearest town just for a cold glass of beer in a four-star hotel. I don't mind admitting it. And I found there are two worlds in this planet living side by side. This is happening everywhere, every city, everywhere. So about a billion of us live with as if there is unlimited access to fossil fuels. We don't think there is a tomorrow. On the bottom three billion, lack of access to fossil fuel even for cooking, okay? This woman's house, this was in the Himalayas and, and there were other places where my wife and I had spent and same thing, she has a kerosene lamp and she had four children, two boys and two girls. And the kerosene lamp was enough just to, two people can read. So the boys would use that to do homework and the girls could not, because the mother would say, oh, you're going to get married another three, four years. So that's, and imagine a drought like what Stock California for four years would do to them. This is exactly what the church was concerned. So blessed by Pope Francis, by the time I got to organizing this, he had stepped down, Pope Francis. So we had the sustainable humanity, sustainable nature, I teamed up with the social scientist, a famous economist from Cambridge, but the last phrase was added by the church, our responsibility. I had never ever thought of this in that, in that way, that it's our responsibility. It's easy to blame Exxon, but each of us is responsible. And this meeting, as usual, was full of Nobel laureates, people like Jeff Sachs, uh, you know, Das Gupta, several chemists, our own Maria Molina, Nobel laureate, was there. So here, what I present to the church, I started looking at this justice issue, which is something I would have never done, but for the church's influence, it shows the CO2 emitted. The bottom three billion emit just two gigatons per year out of the total 27, less than 5%. The top one billion emit 50%. Even that would have been okay if you look at the increase. The increase is not coming because the population is consuming more. The top one billion's consumption is going up. So that's the issue, but it's also positive. It is e easy to reach, reach this top one billion using our social media, Facebook, Twitter, everything. They are well informed. So to me, I see this as a really a positive outcome of the result. And then, you know, uh, these are some of the statements the economists made. This Joe Stiglitz, who's a Nobel laureate in Colombia, he was part of it. So the economists say that economic activity is currently measured solely in terms of GDP, and therefore does not record the degradation of Earth that accompanies it, nor the abject inequalities between countries and within each country. So that's an international equity issue. But just take same America, the card disappeared over the North Atlantic. That's not factored into the GDP. Economists say, no, when you deplete nature, you're depleting wealth. So factor that in, then you will find the real GDP is not really going up that much. And then I talked about this equity issue. 50% of available energy is accessed by just 1 billion people. I am part of the 1 billion, by the way. So, and then the third, to me is more a serious issue, essential to million and time scale of this carbon dioxide molecule and storing up the ocean, 
generations unborn are going to pay the price. So that's where I felt I, we could have never raised it in any scientific circles, nor in a place like UCSD, but we can raise it in the religious context, because that's where we go to our churches, our temples. They can talk about morality, ethics, etc. So normally after this meeting, we brief the Pope in the most breathtaking room you can imagine, right? So I'm chairing this meeting. I'm waiting outside this parking lot. The Peter's Basilica is to the left. And th that building you see is where Pope Francis stays on the second floor. He stays with the rest of us. I, it's one area I'm higher than the Pope. I stay on the fourth floor. He's, <laughs> he's on the second floor. <laughs> so I'm waiting there having this imagination of this breathtaking call, briefing Pope Francis for about 20 minutes, he shows up in the parking lot. You can see the basilica the front, right in the park, he got out of a small, disappointingly small car, I must say. <laughs> and then the chancellor of the academy who's sitting, oh, who's standing there, Chancellor Surrender, he said, he asked me to brief the Pope, so I'm, preparing my 20 minute lecture. And, and next to the Chancellor Saranda is Archbishop Minerath. He's from France. He said, Ram, you have just two minutes. So I had to come up with a parking lot pitch. <laughs> so I, I told the Pope, the Holy Father, that we are all here meeting on your behalf and climate change has become a serious issue. Then I said, the real problem is the three billion who have the least to do with this are going to suffer the worst consequences. And uh, <clears throat> so then he asked in Spanish, what can you do about this? Right? I mean, uh, his, his smile is unbelievable. It just disarms you. I mean, I was, have this grave face, going to talk to you about serious topics. So I, I told him something later I felt kind of a little bit silly. I told him, if you can please include in your speech that people should be good stewards of the planet. That will help a lot. The reason I felt silly is that when we were walking back, Saranda said, Ram, you told the Holy Father what he has been saying for the last 30 years, of people to be good stewards of the planet. So if you see what we wrote there, right? Sustainable relation nature requires change in attitude towards nature, fundamental change, and towards each other, and therefore requires moral leadership. Basically, I, we are all afraid to say this, and I'm not going to say this to you, but I feel comfortable saying to a religious leader, it requires fundamental change in behavior. And that's when my wife reminded me, Ram, there is a good metaphor for this. Remember, you, you, when you had a heart attack, you went to this Dr. Gorneri, she's here, by the way, and she gave you medicines, but she also asked you to change your behavior. And so, yeah, I see a good parallel between the two. There's no use soft peddling and saying, we don't have to make sacrifices of this and that. We have to change, because nature is telling us it has limited capacity, okay? And, and then this group of, they asked us to summarize this in the Journal of Science. So what we concluded, well, this is the entire group of 50. They were philosophers, they were religious scholars, social scientists, et cetera, et cetera. So the transformational step may well be a massive mobilization of public opinion by the Vatican and other religions. So we are appealing to religions, right? For collective action to safeguard the well-being of both humanity and the environment. Right? So that this is what Das Gupta is, a Cambridge economist, and I, it's our own conclusion. Basically, finding ways to develop a sustainable relation with our planet requires not only the engagement of scientists, political leaders, but ultimately also a moral revolution. When I'm reading this, I'm just having the thought, I hope I'm not sounding like our presidential candidate, Bernie Sanders, who calls for a revolution. But something close, religious institutions can 
and should take the lead on bringing about such a new attitude towards creation. Okay? So two weeks later, Pope Francis visits the, the, the Jewish, uh, you know, the Orthodox Church in Jerusalem, Bartholomew, and he, they released a statement, creation is not a property which we can rule over at will, or even less is the property of only a few, the top one billion. Creation is a gift that we care for it and we use it for the benefit of all, always with great respect and gratitude. And I want to tell you this trans transformation taking place. So that's the meeting of the Pontifical Academy. And, and the Pope doesn't come to all our meetings. This one he came for a particular reason because this was a meeting in which the biologists met and concluded that science can explain most of creation. Fortunately, they were a little bit modest. They said most, not all of creation. <laughs> and to which the Pope Francis had a beautiful statement. With 10 minutes, he talked to us. And he concluded, God is not a magician. Saying, science and religion can coexist, right? But certainly in the case of environment, we're all saying the same thing. I wanted to tell you, uh, as a council member, I, there are six of us, we sit circling the pub. So I, I'm behind him. You can't see me, but my name got immortalized. BBC projected with this. God is not a magician. So nobody knows the face. People know such a person exists. So now, uh, let me just see. Yeah, now go to the part two, science, religion, and policy. So we decided, all right. So science and religion are converged on the message about how to protect the environment. So we need to get policy. So we teamed up with the United Nations. And so this is the Pontifical Academy. In the middle, you can see Ban Ki-moon. Sitting next to me is Jeff Sachs, he's an economist. And sitting behind Ban Ki-moon is uh, uh, Cardinal Turkson from Ghana, etc. And there was no fuss, first statement. Human and this climate change is a scientific reality. United Nations doesn't have a problem. Faith leaders don't have a problem, right? And we, they were, I think, amongst the religious, just not Catholics. Protestants are also there. So then the, we said, in this core moral space, the world's religions play a very vital role. There are at least six Nobel laureates in the audience, physicists, chemists. So scientists have no problem anymore talking about this role of world's religions, right? These traditions all affirm the inherent dignity of every individual linked to the common good of all humanity. So then, you know, we normally release a statement. Just to introduce the type of people there, the first, I helped commission the statement. Das Gupta is a development economist. Peter Raven is the most well-known ecologist, works on extinction. Mar you know, Monsignor Sarando is a historian. Margaret Archer, famous, well-known sociologist. Crutzen is a Nobel laureate. Whitey Lee is a Nobel laureate. Molina is a Nobel laureate. Martin Rees is Astronomer Royal of England, so on and so forth. So scientists don't have a problem working with religion on this issue of climate change because it's partly, it has become, we are desperate. We, many of us see the cliff not that far off. Okay, and, and then the Pope released his encyclical, Laudato Si. <coughs> I mean, it's one of the most classic books. You can, I think it'll become a classic. Every one of us have our own favorite paragraph. Mine is where he talks about ushered in the age of integral ecology. It is a sad truth in most universities, natural scientists, social scientists, or two separate silos. Even within natural scientists, we got hundreds of little, little silos. Same thing with, I hope you can say, social scientists. We are doing something about that in this campus. I think Best talked about the Department of Medicine and Scripps getting together. Slowly, these are being, these silos are being broken down. But to me, it's just too slow for the problems we are facing, okay? we still don't know how the two systems interact. 
natural systems is ecology, social system is us, our institutions. We don't know how we are thinking that natural system is infinite size. That's a fundamental flaw in our thinking. No science supports that. Anyway, so we are working on this model. Just look at the, this work I'm doing with two of my daughters who are working with on this issue of uh, the bottom three billion. So we see this world as three worlds, inner basic needs, three billion still trying to fight for it. Beyond basic needs, you can think of it as a middle class, and then the one billion unsustainable consumption. Okay? How does it infect human drivers, ecosystem response? We're just starting. So now I talk about final stage of this alliance science, religion, and policy. We commissioned a meeting called Modern Slavery and Climate Change. This is where all the world's mayors were invited. De Blasio was there, the mayor of London, Rome, and uh, three mayors from here, including our governor, Jerry Brown. And to me, that was sort of a crescendo of this whole thing. There was not a single dissenting voice. It was amazing how cities have figured out for their own survival they have to cut down greenhouse gas emissions. Every mayor came with commitments. And our San Diego mayor, what he did, I think, I think, think of it as legendary. So that was my, you know, uh, far power, not inviting him to that. So that was, and we came with an amazing declaration. And uh, I am, of course, broadening the conversation we had series of meetings with the Dalai Lama. And on the right, you see a famous Indian uh, guru. She's called uh, Amma, means mother. She has hugged personally about 4 million. You think it was even possible, right? She has a huge following in the US, huge following in India, Europe. So she, there, she's at the Vatican. I had her invited to meet Pope Francis. But this was in the issue of trafficking and slavery. So uh, if you're thinking, he has shown the Pope, she has shown the, what else can I show? I've not met God yet. It's, <laughs> there's nothing. <laughs> so I wanted to talk to you about uh, uh, the Paris Agreement. When I went as a science advisor to the Holy See, I didn't even realize there was a role for scientists. Normally, the scientists are not in the inner circle because they think it's time, science, time for science is finished. But it turned out the key argument they were discussing is, should we commit to keeping the planet below one and a half degrees or below two? So below one and a half was being pushed by Philippine, Philippine and Africa. And Philippine delegation came to us. They said, I said, why one and a half? Well, we have estimated if it exceeds one and a half, we would go from a nation of 1,000 islands to just 60. And there was an insensitive, I'm not going to say which country, oh, it'll be much better rulable than just 60 islands. How do you rule a country with 1,000 islands? But scientifically, I was not for it, because one and a half is already done. A degree the planet has already warmed, there is already stock of the blanket is already there. We're still heating it. So another half a degree will happen no matter what we do. So I was afraid putting an impossible thing like that would make nations back away. So I chose for well under two. And there was quite a bit of opposition. Of course, I was viewed as, oh, he's an American, he can adapt to this, so that's why he's pushing for two. But I was, in fact, doing that to make sure that negotiations don't break down. So I was coming out of the hall. I ran into Jerry Brown, our governor. So I told him, how do you think the Americans would behave if you say one and a half, would the Americans back off? He didn't say anything to me. But later it turned out, he met after that scene. I showed him the document. He met with Ban Ki-moon. And Ban Ki-moon apparently called John Kerry. And Kerry said, well, we are OK with one and a half, if that's the case. Any anyway, final statement, as this is the adoption, 
holding the increase in glow to well below two degrees. So that's what was agreed on. I still think that well below two is doable. And the other issue was they have reserved what's called a Warsaw Pact, in which nations can sue each other. So if some nations agree it's below one and a half, if it exceeds one and a half, then they could be sued. My worry is, was, I know it's going to exceed one and a half. The nations will be busy suing each other, not bringing down the emissions. So, so I think it's, uh, anyway, so now you can ask, come on, where is the evidence any of this is working? You know, after that, uh, uh, Pope Francis came to uh, the US, we all know the impact. I was studied by Yale. And, and they basically found out by polling, more Americans and more Catholics have become worried about global warming, plus eight points, plus 11. And the last, moving down, more Americans and more Catholics came to see global warming as a moral issue. These are not huge increases, 6%, 8%, but still, it is 6%, 8%. When the division is between 50 and 45 and five and undecided, moving eight of any of this group have a huge impact. And then more Americans all also came to believe as a social justice fairness issue, which is what it is. So I, I think uh, bringing, broadening the debate, I I'm, I'm feel reasonably comfortable. One thing I wanted to uh, announce here as a proud member of UC, our university, thanks to our president, Janet Napolitano, they took amazing guts on her part to say that this campus, 10 campuses, would become carbon neutral in 10 years. Okay? So Janet Napolitan asked me to do a study. So I, about 50 academics from the 10 campus, we got together in three to four months. We released a report coming up with 10 solutions. So we're just not talking about problems. We also know the solutions. It's not an unsolvable problem by any stretch of imagination. So it's all in the web page. Let me just conclude with my, uh, the two world. Just to give you the scope of the problem, completely decarbonizing the economy, and let's say the top one billion bears responsibility for that, the cost is $450 a person. I don't mean to put down, say, $450 is small piece of money, but it's not a huge amount we are talking about, okay? So when we talk about sacrificing generations on barn with 30, 50 feet sea level rise, it's a $450 problem. And the second issue is the bottom three billion, giving them clean energy access so they can cope with climate change is another $250. You can ask, why should I shell out $250 to somebody sitting in the middle of India or Ghana? If you don't do that, if they follow our carbon footprint, their emissions alone would push us to five, six degree planet. So for our own preservation, we got to give them clean energy access. So that's the project I'm working, you know, this is my daughter Nithya who is leading this. We are removing the mud stoves with clean stoves. We have tested them they bring down the emission by 90%. What my daughter Nithya has done is that created a new way to look at this. So she put wireless sensors, this was funded by Qualcomm, on the stars so that somebody sitting here, if you want to offset your carbon footprint, you can look at this data and pay this woman the cost of the stove. Okay, we found out in two years, she is bringing down so much climate pollution by stitching the stove, she could get the whole stuff paid. So we have created a new financing mechanism where you see that the woman gets a bank, loan from the rural bank. We have lined them up with that. And then my daughter calls it a smart stove because it has smart sensors. And the data comes to a lab in real time, every village, every home. And then she gets the number of hours she cooks with the stove, comes to my lab, I convert them to climate credits, and we have used donation from locally here to create a climate fund and put that money through cell phones. So there's no fraud involved, it goes to the woman. So we are hooking up 
using most sophisticated technology to people living under the most primitive conditions and connect them with the carbon market, okay? So we are, I'm going to India uh, in about two, three weeks. We are trying to scale this up. So I, I want to conclude with what are my next steps. So I think in another 10 days, I'll be, be in India. This meeting is organized by uh, Nitya. Round table with stakeholders on cookstore partnership. We have Indian government, Vodafone, who is doing the phone payment, Qualcomm, rural banks, and World Bank and others. Okay, how do we get around this problem? So in May 2016, I'm working with Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. We want to get an interfaith meeting amongst, just amongst Christianity, <coughs> summit at the National Cathedral. It so happens his wife is sitting on the board of the National Cathedral, so we have actually indirect access to that. The main thing is broaden the American debate. You know, as we know, we are divided on this issue as in many issues. I personally feel climate change is not a political problem. It's not a Republican, Democrat, it's a human problem. So we should be able to discuss it. Academics, we are not able to discuss. Our politicians now, I'm thinking the religious leaders may be able to. So we are working with the Vatican. We are going to bring in evangelicals and other churches. Then in August, we are thinking of a similar meeting what we did with uh, <clears throat> Pope Francis with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Apparently, there are one billion Buddhists in this world. So we met with him, Professor Walter Monk from here, and a few NGOs, so that's also we are thinking. The last is our president, Jared Napolitano, <clears throat> want to take the California example, this uh, bending the curve, and what California is doing to cut down its greenhouse gas pollution to the US General Assembly as a model for others. So those are the, some of the things uh, the UC system is doing. So what happened to my Impala dream? <laughs> it became the smart dream. That's my car. I have it outside in the Pangaea Park. You want to see it. So I want to thank the Pontifical Academies for giving me the front seat in forming this, seeing this alliance form. I, I, if, if I have to give credit to one person, it has to be Pope Francis. And to my wife, who helped connect the dots for me, she's probably very embarrassed I even put her name. And numerous students and postdocs, of course, supported all the work, and my two daughters, who, are, who could have had lucrative careers here, but they're working in the village project. And because my advice to my children is do something useful. And numerous colleagues at UC and elsewhere. I also want to thank uh, uh, my cardiologist who is here. She, she rescued me from a heart attack, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you.